to a night we'll never remember. Whatever happens here tonight may as well never have happened at all. The Hangover, a simple comedy about a Vegas bachelor party gone awry, or a dark Freudian parable exposing the anguish of the modern man. I'm still putting the broken pieces of my psyche back together. There's an interesting subtext to Todd Phillips' movie, which turns 10 this year. I want to talk about memory. No, better yet, I want to talk about selective memory. The character's blackout is a metaphor for repression. Torch it. Who are you? I don't know, Phil. Apparently, I'm a guy who marries complete strangers. As Phil, Stu, and Alan retrace their steps to piece together what happened the night before, they confront buried selves that shock them. Why, when I come after you guys, he starts screaming like crazy and throw me a trunk, huh? No. Well, I did that. And in the sequels, these guys can't help repeating this pattern. Something dark and wild periodically resurfaces within them, however badly they want to escape it. It happened again. Seriously, what is wrong with you three? So there's a fascinating cultural commentary hidden in these comedies. These men represent a discontentment haunting the contemporary American male, which may in fact be impossible to cure. So here's our take on what The Hangover reveals about repression in today's society and why the wolf pack's inner demons will never go away. This demon takes me to some pretty weird places. Before we go on, we want to tell you a little bit about this video's sponsor. Mubi is a curated film streaming service with a twist. You get 30 films per month, a new film every day. It's a hand-picked selection of movie gems from around the world. So click the link in our description below to get a full month of Mubi for free. When The Hangover starts, the three main characters are dissatisfied in their day-to-day -day lives. You should enjoy yourself because come Sunday, you're gonna start dying. Just a little bit, every day. Unable to face the scope of their unhappiness, these guys unknowingly resort to the defense mechanism of repression, banishing distressing thoughts and impulses to the unconscious mind, where we stop being aware of them at all. It's only when they get together for Doug's bachelor party in Vegas, the US's symbolic epicenter of pleasure-seeking, that they allow the release of their long bottled up ids. Who does shit like that, man? Uh, as someone who has a lot of issues, obviously. I'm a sick man. In Freudian psychoanalysis, the id is the instinctual pleasure-seeking self, our most basic drives, often expressed through sex and violence. Crucially, the id is unconscious. As Freud wrote, it is the dark, inaccessible part of our personality. So this is why the wolf pack's deep instincts only come out when they're drugged, and their usual self-controlling mechanisms are disabled. All of the movies feature wild animals that show up as a result of their debauchery, which represent the primal animal selves they've unleashed. It's fitting that there are three guys at the center of these movies, because broadly speaking, they align with Freud's concepts of the superego, the ego, and the id. Stu corresponds to the superego, the psyche's internalized moral standards and ideals, which come from our parents and our society. If the id is I want, the superego is I should. I was happy and my life was good. Getting married like a dentist should. Stu's obsession with the person he should be is encapsulated in the way he believes it's not good enough to be a dentist and aspires to be a higher status doctor. I'm actually a doctor. Yeah, you said that several times last night, but really you're just a dentist. He is determined to marry Melissa, even though he doesn't like her, because he thinks she's a suitable partner and the length of their courtship necessitates a proposal. We've been dating for three years. It's time. This is how it works. This relationship forces him to lie all the time. I told her we're two hours outside of wine country, and she bought it. But he doesn't see this as a problem because he's so used to lying to himself. She's strong-willed, and I respect that. Wow. Wow. He's in denial. Stu's long-term denial and his overdeveloped superego lead him to display almost a split personality. He's a nerdy, thoroughly vanilla guy in his conscious life. Stu is Joe. Joe gets soft white rice in lukewarm water. But under the influence of drugs and alcohol, a whole other person surfaces. This guy is the craziest, wildest bastard I ever met in my life. Oh, this guy? His blackout lets him bond with a woman who actually makes him happy. I'll tell you one thing, you look seriously happy here, man. But in the light of day, he declares her socially unacceptable. I married a whore! How dare you? She's a nice lady! When Stu starts to learn about his other self, he tries to suppress it back down into oblivion. It's all evidence of a night 
that never happened. That is why we're torching all of it. At the end of the first movie, he takes a big step forward when he releases the anger he didn't know was there. I think in a healthy relationship, sometimes a guy should be able to do what he wants to do. And admits to himself that he's not okay with Melissa's infidelity. Because whatever this is, ain't working for me. Since when? Since you that waiter on your cruise last June, Boom! Yet in The Hangover Part 2, we see that he's reverted to his old repressive techniques. He was missing the spark you look for in a man. When the wolf pack has another blackout, yet again, Stu is the one that goes the wildest. And this is no coincidence. Because Stu is the most repressed of the wolf pack, his dangerously pent up id is the most potent and in need of release. I got a dark side. There's a demon in me. In all three blackouts, only Stu goes so far as to alter his body in ways that can only be reversed through surgery. It's as if the wild id within him is trying to leave a permanent mark that it was there. In the first movie, his willingness to pull out his own tooth is an example of displacement, or redirecting an aggressive impulse onto a new target. His real motivation is to prove his worth as a doctor. Well, Alan bet you that you weren't a good enough dentist to pull out your own tooth. But this comes out as an act of self-harm, which gets at the way that his obsession with living up to this doctor ideal is hurting him. In part two, he has sex with a trans prostitute, despite having no inkling of this desire in his conscious life. It's a violation of my moral code. Don't be sad, Stu. You love it. You were crying, saying how special it was. And this behavior so shocks him that Stu is finally motivated to accept his repressed self. I have a weakness for prostitutes. All kinds, apparently. He realizes that his inner darkness has to be integrated into his life, and he even seems empowered by it. I wish I was a boring dentist who had a boring life and boring friends, but I don't. I'm not. Even so, Stu doesn't tell the woman he's marrying about his experience with the prostitute. It's true, he has semen in him. I said demon. But you also have semen in you, remember? No. It's not relevant, but thank you, Alan. So he's still lying about his latent urges because he feels the truth would threaten his traditional heterosexual marriage. In the credits of the third movie, when he wakes up with breasts, it appears Stu has a buried desire to experiment with his gender as well. I have boobies now! But given his pattern, he'll likely repress this and continue to shock himself with more and more extreme behavior during blackouts. The other irony of Stu's story is that the wife he rejected from the original night in Vegas goes on to marry a surgeon. Another doctor, can you believe it? Another doctor. Who was evidently secure enough to see past the stigma of her profession. Well, technically I'm an escort, but stripping's a great way to meet the clients. And appreciate the kind, accepting person she is. Because Stu is so uncomfortable with himself, he missed the opportunity to be with someone who made him feel completely unselfconscious and uninhibited. Alan is most closely aligned with the id. He is pure instinct with no filter or self-consciousness. Oh, you know what? Next week's no good for me. The Jonas Brothers are in town. The id, which is Latin for it, is a chaotic mess of impulses without an organizing self or narrative. You are literally too stupid to insult. Thank you. And likewise, Alan has never felt the need to grow up and become a respectable, breadwinning member of society. I'm a stay-at-home son. And when we actually peer into Alan's mind in part two, he even sees himself and his friends as children. The other guys are wary of Alan's uninhibited eccentricity. Who brought this guy along? But deep down, they're drawn to him. He's actually kind of funny. And this represents the way the movie is celebrating a juvenile silliness. He's jacking his little weenus. <laughs> Put yourself together, bro. Not at the table, Carlos. Alan's capacity for childlike brotherly fun is what the other guys are missing in their two adult lives. When Doug introduced me to you guys, I thought, wait a second, could it be? And now I know for sure I just added two more guys to my wolf pack. It's significant that in the first two movies, Alan is the one responsible for drugging the others. I was told it was ecstasy. Why would you give us ecstasy? Because I want everybody to have a good time and I knew you guys wouldn't take it. What we're seeing is the id overtaking the restrictive parts of their psychology to let them have fun for once. By the third Hangover film though, even Alan starts to progress beyond being just id. I must resign from the wolf pack. The movies eventually shape Leslie Chow into the symbol of pure id. So Mexico, huh? What are you doing down here? You know, I'm doing blow, same old, same old. Ooh, I got into cockfighting. If Alan was a fun, playful representation of impulsiveness, Chow, the selfish, reckless criminal, is framed as the dark mirror of what it means to live a life that's purely about chasing pleasure and avoiding pain. 
Phil would be the ego of the story. The ego, which is Latin for I, is the organized concept of self, which follows the reality principle, meaning it bases its actions on the reality of the external world. All right, let's just track this thing. <clears throat> All right, what's the last thing we remember doing last night? Rather than just doing whatever it feels like, as the id does by following the pleasure principle. Mother, Oreo smoothie now! Freud described the ego as, quote, like a man on horseback who has to hold in check the superior strength of the horse. And this explains Phil's special connection with Alan. I can't be your hero anymore. Okay. He clearly likes Alan and enjoys his free spirit. Alan, you're the man! But Phil himself is careful not to sever his connection to reality and normality. Look, if someone comes and finds a dead body and a pile of cocaine, we're gonna spend the rest of our lives in a die prison. The ego finds socially acceptable ways to satisfy the id without causing long-term destruction. And this is why Phil considers the ritual of the bachelor party so sacred. This is the bachelor party. What? That's bullshit. <laughs> You can't just skip out of a bachelor party still. It's a socially sanctioned opportunity to let loose. I mean, he's getting married in Thailand. That's great for him, but what about us? Unlike the others, Phil is notably unscathed by their dark adventures. You just forget. It goes away. As the ego, he maintains a balance in his life between the extremes of Alan's wild fun and Stu's buttoned-up control. And he does this by periodically releasing his bottled-up impulses and then forgetting about whatever he did as he returns to his stable adult life. I mean, what's the worst that's happened? The tattoo? Definitely. Definitely. Tattoo was the worst. While the id and the superego are generally at odds with each other... Do you even know what's going on? Yes, I do. Phil's doing all the work, I'm his assistant, and you're standing there looking like an idiot. It's the ego's job to negotiate the relationship between the two. So that's enough. That's enough. Guys, we can't fall apart now. We gotta stick together. Phil gets along best with both Alan and Stu and understands how to control them. The ego moderates the conception of the self. And in Phil, we see a person who's having to update his story of himself to more accurately reflect his phase of life. In the first movie, Phil mourns the loss of his young, carefree self now that he's a responsible husband, father, and school teacher. I may never go back. I might just stay in Vegas. Phil is a kind of inverse of Stu, who's pretending to be happy. Phil pays a lot of lip service to his unhappiness. Look, I left my wife and kid at home so I can go with you guys to Vegas. You know how difficult that was? It's really sweet, Phil. Yeah. Dude, I was being sarcastic. I hate my life. He puts up a front of being the cavalier cool guy. I repeat, please disperse as it's important to him to live up to his self-image of being young, fun, and reckless. Why don't you just stop worrying for one minute? Be proud of yourself. While in actuality, he seems pretty content with his life. In scenes like this one... Let's go hook up with Doug. We'll deal with the baby later. Phil, we're not gonna leave a baby in the room. There's a tiger in the bathroom. Phil's lack of concern for the baby is bizarre, considering he's the only one who's a father. This isn't authentic behavior. Just leave him in the car. We're only gonna be five minutes. Well, we're not leaving a baby in the car. He'll be fine. I cracked the window. As their adventure gets more and more out of hand, Phil has to admit that he's not willing to blow up the life he secretly likes. I'm a school teacher. I got a family. Okay, I'm all for secrecy, but I'm not gonna torch a cop car. The trilogy is full of nods to westerns, like these early still shots of the desert that might remind us of the start of No Country for Old Men. And when the guys wake up with their hangover in part two, we hear the western-style song, The Beast in Me. The beast in me has had to learn to live with pain. The Western undertones hint at a nostalgia for an era when machismo was more celebrated and allowed free reign. Four of us wolves running around the desert together in Las Vegas, looking for strippers and cocaine. In its broad strokes, The Hangover might remind us of Fight Club, David Fincher's film about, spoiler alert, a man who's so repressed that he creates a free-spirited alter ego, Tyler Durden. I want you to hit me as hard as you can. To let out the aggressive impulses he won't let himself act on. All the ways you wish you could be, that's me. Alan is the hangover's Tyler. He may not look exactly like Brad Pitt, but he represents living without inhibition, and he drugs the guys to free them up. And like Fight Club, the hangover speaks to a crisis of masculinity in our society. Advertising has us chasing cars and clothes, working jobs we hate so we can buy shit we don't need. In both movies, the male characters lead double lives because their society doesn't let them express their primal instincts for aggression and for intense bonding with other men. Come on, I was gonna let you go, you're my boy, and you're my man. 
Funnily enough, The Hangover is also a kind of 2000s update to the 80s Three Men and a Baby. Well, it can't be that difficult. All we gotta do is, is feed it. It'll shut up. As Alan himself acknowledges in a subtle shout out. It's got uh, Ted Danson and Magnum P.I. and that Jewish actor. Both feature a goofy setup of three guys finding a mysterious baby, while their underlying story is about men grieving the loss of their carefree bachelor life as they age into a phase of adult responsibility. I assemble cities of the future. I can certainly put together a goddamn diaper. Another striking resemblance between these films is that they spend an unnecessary amount of time on thriller and crime plots that go nowhere. Bring money to Big Rock in Mojave Desert at dawn be at the phone booth at the corner of 81st and Columbus at exactly 8 p.m. tonight. The movie also has some aspects of Superbad, where the teens' plan to party hard is really driven by their sadness about losing each other. I love you. It's like, why don't we say that every day? Why can't we say it more often? The guy's search for Doug symbolizes their repressed fear of losing him as he prepares to get married and start a new chapter. Moreover, these issues aren't uniquely male. Bridesmaids follows a woman in a similar transitional period acting out this should be open because it's civil rights. This is the 90s. Right. It's not. You're, you're in the wrong decade. And denying that anything is wrong. Well, I'm fine. No, you're not fine. You're not fine yet. Because it's hard for her to lose her best friend to marriage. Oh my god! <laughs> So there's a universality to the grief that human beings feel as they move beyond the time of life when friendships are center stage and say goodbye to their young, responsibility-free selves. Now that I'm getting married, I'm going to be spending a lot more time with Cassandra. Of course. Yeah. It's the way it should be. The point is, you need to let me go. At first glance, The Hangover may appear to be a celebration of partying. Remember what happens in Vegas days? In Vegas. But as the movies get darker, they reveal a perversity in American binge drinking culture. After the hard rock got blacked out, it was like emptiness. <laughs> After all, what does it say that the hallmark of a great night out is not being able to remember it? Why can't we remember a goddamn thing from last night? Because we obviously had a great time. Phil believes forgetting works. I promise you, no one's ever gonna find out about this. But we just found out about it. And then we forget. That's what we do. I've done so much f***ed up shit, and I just forget about it. And he reflects a society that implicitly encourages these kinds of releases in the dark so that its citizens will continue with a status quo that doesn't actually satisfy them. That's what I'm going to do. You're just going to forget about it. Never happened compensating for a lackluster reality with big nights out to get it out of their system pacifies these dissatisfied men so they're not motivated to change their lives. Thanks for the bachelor party, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I just wish we could actually remember some of it. But if, as a collective, we feel the urge to numb ourselves in the name of fun, eventually we have to ask, what's so oppressive about our daily lives that we're running away from? Don't you think it's strange that You've been in a relationship for three years and you still have to lie about going to Vegas. Yeah, I do. But trust me, it's not worth the fight. Unlike most narratives, which fix their characters' issues by the end, the Hangover franchise doesn't really show these guys making any progress. Each movie wraps up with lessons seemingly learned, only to undo all that. The guys never overcome this cycle. What we're seeing here is repetition compulsion, where the unconscious mind makes us repeat destructive or traumatic behavior. This is also at the center of Alfred Hitchcock's Vertigo, in which Scotty is haunted by a debilitating fear until he returns to the scene of the crime and confronts it. I want to stop being haunted. That film's near happy ending I made it. is a bait and switch, as Scotty ends up reliving his traumatic experience and will now be even more damaged than before. Likewise, in Hangover Part 3, the guys return to the scene of their original crime, Vegas. I told myself I would never come back. They capture the trilogy's dark id figure, Chow, yet this dark id cannot be escaped. The wedding cake. It was from Leslie. We had a sick night, bitches! In The Hangover Part 2, Phil says, We weren't ourselves last night. But in fact, these unconscious selves contain a real and important part of them. Late last night, you climbed the walls of our monastery, shouting our question about love, marriage, and the meaning of life. So one moral of this story is in vino veritas. Our best bet is to strive for a waking life that gratifies our truest urges. You ended up ditching Melissa, and two years later, you met your true soulmate. You take Vegas out of that equation, you would have married a 
The Wolfpack's fourth member, Doug, shows that this is a possibility, at least if your desires are considered normal by society. He appears fulfilled by his loving relationship with Tracy. You're the best. Hey. Team. And his well-adjusted nature is why he doesn't have that much to do in these movies. Well, we each had one beer last night, right? I mean, you too. Yeah, but I left early, remember? If The Hangover contains any advice, it's that just as our greatest dangers come from within us, the answers to our problems are buried within us too. Every memory lives somewhere deep within. To solve their mysteries, all the guys have to do is remember. Can someone tell me where White Doug is? He's on the roof, Alan. And he goes up, the power goes out. Holy shit! We may not be willing to face what we really know deep down. I don't remember anything. Do you? No. I got nothing. But if we don't, sooner or later, that buried truth is coming back to bite us. Good or bad, we don't remember, so we got nothing to talk about. Nothing, guys. Nothing. Deal? Hey guys, this is Grace. And today I want to talk to you about one of our favorite places to watch movies, Mubi. Mubi is a treasure trove of films from around the globe. Every day a new film is added and the oldest is taken away. So in this world where it's very easy to spend hours debating what you should watch, Mubi is like having a really cool friend with amazing taste in movies, making it so much easier for you. They feature hard to come by masterpieces, indie festival darlings, influential art house and foreign films, lesser known films by your favorite famous directors and more. Plus, you can even download the films to watch offline. And there are no ads ever. One movie you can watch right now on Mubi is Citizen Four. Laura Poitras' Oscar-winning documentary gives a first-person look at whistleblower Edward Snowden's meetings with her and journalist Glenn Greenwald, as Snowden exposed the NSA's surveillance tactics. We can't recommend Mubi highly enough. You can try it out now for free for a whole month. Just click the link in the description below.